Um, I'm uh, Kevin O'Leary. I'm a user experience designer from Acquia. Uh, I've been in, uh, in brand design and graphic design and uh, all kinds of different design for the last 20, 25 years or so. Um, and uh, I've, uh, I'm, today I'm, I'll be presenting with, uh, with Martin Verbershot. Martin, you want to talk a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm uh, from Dutch Open Projects. Uh, I uh, spend my time mostly making themes. I communicate a lot with uh, external designers and uh, try to be the like the, the person who like coordinates stuff between designers and themers to get the optimal result. So um, what we're going to talk about today is um, a kind of a combination of brand and theming. I'm going to get into a little bit of sort of um, you know theoretical stuff about brand and, uh, and and a little practical stuff about brand and then I'm going to kick it over to Martin at about half at the halfway point and he's going to sort of get into more of the nitty-gritty you know actual theming um, nuts and bolts of, of, of the things that uh, that you can do to make this a reality in, in, in your actual sites so um, as I said before I um, I've been involved with brand for, for, for a very long time, and uh, long before actually I was involved with, uh, with, with theming for Drupal or even with, uh, with user experience design. And um, you know, one of the things I wanted to do when I, uh, when I put together the presentation is I wanted to, uh, oh, I'm sorry, actually, first of all, before we go, before we go any further, I wanted to ask a little bit uh, about um, who, who Who's in the audience today? How many, uh, how many of you would sort of self-identify as um, de uh, module developer, designers? So there's a lot of designers. Project managers, there's a few of those. Themers, okay, about even on themers and designers. So anyway, um, so talking about brand, um, I wanted to, when I was putting together my, the, the deck for today, I wanted to, try to find some kind of a funny or humorous or insightful, interesting quote about brand, maybe from one of my sort of design gods, like uh, you know Massimo Vignelli or Paul Rand or one of these people who I, I looked up, up to and respect. And I was, doing a, I, I was doing a lot of Google searches around you know, brand and uh, quote and funny quote and funny brand quote. And um, I, unfortunately, I wasn't really able to find anything really funny. And the, thi the thing that kept popping up uh, on funny and brand and quote was um, uh, Russell Brand and uh, funny quotes from, from him. And uh, he's a very funny man. I thought kind of dovetailed in quite nicely since he's English. Um, so uh, here's, a, here's a little quote from Russell Brand. It's, uh, even as a junkie, I stayed true to vegetarianism. I shall have heroin, but I shan't have a hamburger. What a sexy little paradox. So. Uh, I thought that was quite funny. Um, anyway, it does say a little bit about personal brands. And people talk a lot today about personal brands. People have a personal brand. Do you have a personal brand? Um, and uh, you know, obviously, sexiness and being a kind of a rock and roll poet and uh, being a former junkie are all sort of aspects of Russell Brand's sort of quote personal brand. But I think this is kind of it's a little bit silly in a way because the brand really. Um, is something that's uh, sort of an imitation of something that's really an essential human quality, which is the personality. So th these are really kind of aspects of, 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 of his personality more than his personal brand. And um, you know, I think that all brand kind of grows out of the personality. Everyone has you know, facial features, um, a dress style, a, a tone of voice, you know, expressions, things that they do, all of these aspects that sort of add up to who we are, they're sort of natural, and they're the natural way that we sort of interact with each other and, and know, you know who's who and, and, and whether you can trust somebody or whether you really want to be friends with somebody, how you interact in social situations. It's all about, you know, essentially about your personality. And the brand is really, um, it's, it's, a, it's an impulse that arises out of this personality. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of, I'm going to do the history of brand in three images. So um, the first image here is, uh, this is an ancient Indonesian um, mask. And uh, one of the first ways I think that human beings ever um, sort of began to identify themselves as a group is, you know, through creating forms of dress and masks 
is one of them, scarification, lots of different ways that people you know, did things to themselves to say something more than this is just who I am, but I identify as part of this larger group. So uh, I, I think it was really interesting that sort of this shape then kind of gets repeated through history, this sort of face shape gets translated into other forms. We fast forward into the Middle Ages and you've got this sort of shield shape that, um, that echoes that sort of mask you know, form. And then this is, again, this is a kind of an, a, an example of a group, a, a group identification. You've got the coat of arms, which is, starts with the family and then it becomes something that identifies you know, the, the, uh, the city state, the nation state, you know, and uh, larger and larger and larger and groups of people over, over the course of history, you know, create these, these symbols or images to essentially put, a, put an image or a personality on a group. That's essentially what the brand is. It's putting a personality on a group. So fast forward to um, today and we have, again, the same shield, the same coat of arms is still reappearing throughout you know, uh, you know, modern corporate branding. And it's, it's, it's echoing and it's drawing from this essential quality of, you know, let me try to put some kind of visual structure on, on, a, on, on a group, uh, to create a personality for a group, which is what a brand is all about. It's the shared identity of a group. So um, what about the theme? So the theme, we're, obviously we're here to talk about Drupal, we're here to talk about Drupal theming. The theme essentially is a, the same thing as the brand. It's, it's just the expression of the brand on the web or in electronic form, whether it's on the web or on a, a mobile phone or, or ho what, however you're using Drupal to, you know, to disseminate your theme you know, across the world. The, the theme is really inextricable from the brand. And it doesn't matter whether, you're, uh, whether your organization is a corporation or a nonprofit or a, a government agency. These are all, the brand is sort of, you know, essentially just that expression of the identity of the group. And so what you want your brand to be is you want it to be consistent. You want that expression to be the same everywhere uh, anybody sees it so that they can so that they can react to it and apprehend it and, and interact with it in much the same way that, that they would interact with, you know, on, on a human level with, a, with, a, with, a, with another person. You want your brand to be that, that personal expression of the group and that people can understand it and they can, you know, know about who you are and, and you know, and, and you can put forward certain ideas like, you know, we're trustworthy or we're intelligent or we're, you know, whatever it is that, the, that, that are the sort of core values of the organization. So um, when you start in this process, I think it's important, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit in, in a second about audiences, about personas, and about, you know, how you um, know who you're talking to and know who you're, you're telling your uh, uh, brand story to. But, before you get into that uh, aspect of it, you really need to think about who, who is this group? I mean, the brand is the identity of the group. Who are the people in the group? And more importantly, who are the people in the group who are actually going to have control over aspects of the brand and over aspects of the theme and how those things are sort of, you know, passed out into the world? So um, I think it's important. This is obviously, um, this is not a... Um, this is not every organization, but it's, you know, I, I think many organizations have, you know, similar categories as, to this. You know, when you're, when you're talking about, you know, creating a, you know, a site or a set of sites, you know, to, to carry forward your brand message, you usually have a product manager, you usually have themers, developers who are, who are putting together the site, and then uh, a, a lot more sort of what I call section owners, people who are, you have one person who's sort of the editor of the blog section or the editor of, a, a, of another particular, you know, section of content in your site or in your number of sites. And then you have content editors who are actually involved in um, the day-to-day -day business of writing blogs, putting together articles, you know, getting, you know, the content which expresses the, uh, you know, the ideas that, you're, that, that, that are core to your brand out to the public. Um, so it's important to think about them. And then also uh, Martin is gonna get into, um, you know, at, at a later point, he's gonna, he's gonna talk a little bit more about, you know, 
how we divide up roles and um, tasks and uh, intelligently look at um, you know what each of these people does and and and, uh, and how they and, ha and and what what they have authority over essentially so but really ultimately what what you, what you want is you want to have as little theming ability as possible at the lowest level and then and I, by that I don't mean um, you know personal ability the, the ability of the person to to, to come up with theming, but you want to sort of take that out of the hands of the, of the content editor, the section owner, and leave as much as possible um, you know, at, at the top of the pyramid so that you can maintain that consistency. Because otherwise, you're going to have certain section owners theming things one way, and other people are theming you know, parts of their site in, in a different way, and, 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 and quickly everything starts to get out of control. And you know, again, Martin is going to get into the sort of nuts and bolts of exactly how you do that, how you maintain that consistency, and how you keep your theme small so that you can, uh, you can make sure that, um, that, that those things are sort of taken off the plate of the people who really need to be concerned about, you know, well, what's this blog post say, not what color is the H1 or what font is my, is my text set in. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about audiences and personas. So uh, how many people uh, have worked with personas before or use personas in their in their day-to-day -day work? OK, a few. So personas, essentially, there's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of writing out there about what is a persona. And um, just briefly, essentially, a persona is, 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 the, is the core user of the product or the, or, or, or the message that you're trying to get across. So if, say, for instance, if you were talking about a product, the, the persona is the, is, is the person or persons, and usually there are several personas in a, in a personas document when you start to put together personas to figure out you know, how, your, how your product or your site gets used. Um, you think about two or three different sort of core users who are the people who are, who are regularly using your product or regularly using your site. Um, and, uh, and, and that's very important. I think every design team and every project really needs to have uh, good personas documentation and you know, um, really keep going back to them on a regular basis to understand why are we doing these things? Why are we, why are we building in this way? Does it fit you know, our personas? But then in addition to the personas, you have this sort of greater universe of, um, you know, of people who might be coming to your site. So for instance, in the case of, um, of a, you know, a company site, you might have your, 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 your key personas, two or three key personas who are your product users. But then there's this other sort of, these other sort of ancillary kind of audiences, which are people who might only rarely or occasionally come to your site, but they have to be thought about and, and considered you know, particularly when you're putting to the, together your, your content strategy, your information architecture, the, and, and as well as your brand design, because brand will sort of, you know, will tailor itself specifically to cert certain audiences in slightly different ways. So in a, in a company site, you might have partners, you might have media companies who are writing things about you, um, uh, or writing, you know, articles about, about your company. You might have potential hires. Uh, you might have, a, in the case of an open source company, you might have you know, community members, people who are, you know, are, are affiliated or associated with what you're doing, but not necessarily working or employed by you. You might have uh, competition or investors, people who want to uh, give money to your company to make it uh, keep going, hopefully. Um, and, uh, you know, all of, these, all of these audiences need to be sort of taken into account in the, uh, when you're thinking about how you, um, how you structure your, your, your site and your information architecture. So just getting into the IA a little bit, um, uh, it's important um, when, you, when you've worked with your content strategist and you've come up with your audiences and your personas to have a, a real simple, clear visualization of your IA. And you know, a lot of people use a tree. I use a tree. It's not essential. If you have some other visual metaphor which you, which you find more appropriate or which you think is a better way to, um, you know, to step back from the, from the whole and see sort of all the parts and how they work together, then, then that's great. Um, but uh, it, it's just important that you can do that, that you can sort of 
get it all out on paper, print it out, maybe put it up on a wall. A lot of people put it up on a wall. I know that when we were working on the Aquia site, we took the, the entire old Aquia site, uh, which many of you probably have seen from uh, you know, two or three years ago, or um, you know, it's been around for, for, for a while before we, 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 we did our update. Um, and we, we took every single page in the site, or every single main section page, and printed them all out and stuck them all on the wall. It was like an, a it was a wall the size of this screen, filled with pages with little pieces of tape and you know sharpie lines going in between them. And as soon as you see all that, you know it was a great eye opener for us because immediately we we saw all these holes and oh my God, look at this workflow here. What is the user going to do here? They're they're sort of sent down a you know, shunted down a dead end and, you know, oh, here's a hole and, you know, things, you know, come forward very, very quickly. And then we use that to create, you know, an information architecture map that, for the new site, that sort of was more, you know, more well organized. We were able to step back and see the whole picture and sort of map it out. Where do we want, what do we want to happen in all of these different uh, cases and for all of these different audiences and sections within the site. So um, the, the other thing that you can do, which I strongly recommend, is to create a master theme document, which is, um, in, 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 uh, in the case of, uh, of what we did, we put together um, a document that, uh, that, was, that was done in the context of, of, of our site design, of our approved site design, and, um, and showed how every element of the site was going to be themed. Um, now, uh, chapter three put together a great one of these, um, which you can, which is available uh, on the web. Interesting side note, you notice that uh, chapter three has a new logo too. So people are constantly rebranding and updating, and uh, this, this is for a few, from a few years ago, and uh, you, you'll see that, th that their whole brand identity has evolved and, uh, and, and, and changed, and I, I, I love the new stuff that, they, that they're doing now. It's really, it's really terrific. But they put together this document a few years ago, which is essentially, um, it's a, it's a multi-state a multi fireworks uh, document that has essentially every single element that you would need to theme in Drupal. Um, and uh, so a designer can go in and open this document up and sort of essentially just, you know, change fonts, change colors, change, um, change the styles, and then begin to sort of build out their own uh, branded sort of style guide from that. And th that's essentially what we did um, when, we, when we created the Aquia site. We, we put together all of the different um, elements, all the different HTML elements, obviously, H1 through 6, unordered lists, ordered lists, et cetera. This document, actually, this is just, just a snippet of it. It went on for several pages and went into you know, a great deal of detail with block quotes and you know, two columns of text and you know, little pieces of intro text, all kinds of different uh, theme elements as well as you know, overrides, things that would, areas where the, where the essential theme uh, would have to be overridden. For instance, in the sidebar, you know, there's, there's a different uh, ordered list style than there is in the, in the main content area. So that's just uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, a, a kind of a quick overview of, you know, of starting with brand, thinking about brand as the face of the organization, of, of, uh, as, the, as the sort of personality of the group, and then how to begin to, you know, pull that all together and, and, and put that message into, into a theme which is sort of synchronous with the brand and, um, and gets across you know, your brand personality to, to, the, to the people who, uh, who you want to, to see it. Now, Martin is going to get into uh, talking about, you know, some of the uh, nitty-gritty theming elements, and uh, so, uh, um, and then, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go into questions after that. So, right. go ahead, Martin. So, whose theming folder looks like this? Uh, I have had selectors that look like this, uh, and we've all had these moments that clients have added a page or a block, and they had to call like, hey, it looks not themed, can you do that for me? Um, this happens to a lot of themers, and uh, well, we're going to take a look at how we can make things more robust. So, uh, 
and it's actually a thing that not only teamers have an impact on uh, it's while we ask, ask like uh, are there project managers and module developers in the house and uh, so in this session I'll mostly uh, take a look at things from a themers perspective but I'll also like, mention just a few things for developers and project managers to just pay attention to so uh, the problem actually is that um, there's no amount of abstraction between uh, the content of the site and the presentation of the content. So every time there becomes, well, every time the content grows or it changes, then the theme needs to grow. So what we want to do is like make the theme behave like a lens. So the site can grow, but the theme will stay the same size. Sure, it might grow just a little bit from time to time, but uh, there will be abstraction between the two. So I came up with just a set of principles that I stick with to make themes more scalable. This is about separating structure from components. And a component is code that just works regardless of context. So it can be a block or a menu or maybe a search view or uh, just anything really and the whole point is that it always just works no matter the region or the page it's always the same and structure connects these components with content so that we form a page uh, the structure of the page can be easily seen in google just going to the block administration page there's no content no components so we just see the structure and then once it's connected something like this. In this process of working with components, markup is central. So every time, every time you need to add something, you look at the pattern library, like uh, Kevin shared you uh, from the Acquia site with all the, just like what does a heading need to look like or how does a search block need to look. You look at that and you match it with a component. And if it's not already built, then like you build the component. And then you know which markup to write for that piece of the design. And the important part is here that it needs to be documented. So when you look at templates in Drupal, you always see these massive comment blocks. Documentation for components doesn't need to be that big, but uh, it's about module developers that uh, maybe may not be familiar with front-end development best practices, and those are really the people that you want to document for. Like, uh, I've created this component, and every module can use it. It's uh, maybe a piece of CSS or JavaScript. Uh, so just document short how should this be used. And it's also important to stick with it. Like, uh, a lot of people are a bit uh, unsure about it. Like, when you work with external designers that may not understand all of this. Uh, I don't know how Drupal works, but that's not the point. You should take control of that. And uh, for example, in the design I showed earlier, we had two different search blocks. They're both search blocks, but one has a blue button, the other one has a black button. So you could style those based on the region that they're in. But then you're back at the beginning and you Thrown, thrown every, everything overboard again. So uh, it's important to start uh, learning to think in defaults and overrides. Everything needs to default, so when people add stuff, it will always look acceptable. So usually the most simple version of something is the best default. And the way we do this is we use the cascade in CSS to make overrides of components as efficient as possible. So back to that, uh, no, that one. Uh, the one with the blue button would be the default. And the override would just override the color of the button. So we stack the classes and that way we can keep uh, the benefit of uh, it being, uh, well, you can predict what it will do. It will always be that search block with the black button. And uh, when we talk about sticking with this way of working, um, 
people tend to uh, make separate style sheets for ID fixes, for example. And uh, this is also something that doesn't, but it really conflicts with it. Because uh, once you change a component, you should be able to predict what effect it will have. And if you have uh, fixes for that component in a separate style sheet, you can quickly lose sight of that. So uh, one thing that HTML5 boilerplate, for example, does is add classes to HTML elements. You can put them on the body or data inside the body. It doesn't really matter. But the, the point of the classes is that you can style things for separate browsers in its own context. So keep everything in sight. And uh, so making components is basically just uh, writing CSS, JavaScript. Maybe uh, you, you made a template for it. But how do we connect it with the output from modules? Modules have a lot of classes by default, but they don't match the classes that you came up with for your components. So there are actually modules that can do that. This place we, I think most of you will be familiar with. Uh, you can use it to connect uh, classes or markup with entities, nodes, user profiles, or comments. Uh, and I've had situations when a designer just gave me three designs and I had like 20 content types and I had to match them with the content types. And when I didn't have Display Suite, I just had a lot of templates with the same code just to match them with content types. And with Display Suite, you can keep that to just one template and make the connection in the admin. So block class is a well, module which lets you add classes to blocks. So uh, it sounds a bit weird maybe to add a class for a block in the admin instead of in your theme. But it actually makes sense because uh, blocks by default have classes based on the module that it comes from. And uh, well, as a themer, you don't really control which modules are used most of the time. So you want to be able to make uh, a module developer set the class himself once he came up with a block and that way your styling will automatically be attached to the block that he came up with. Uh, I believe the module also lets you create templates for the block that you just create a class for but I actually never use that because most of the time you just change uh, the stuff inside the content variable of the block. The block markup is by default really just, just a wrapper. So uh, menu attributes lets you do it with uh, menu items, add classes to menu items, and uh, I see lots of people styling the menu items based on the IDs that menu items get, which is possible, but it can get really risky when you work with multiple environments, like a, a development environment and a production environment. The IDs will change, maybe, you will know up front, so it, you better be on the safe side and just use classes and attach them again in the admin. Fuse has a, a little field at the left bottom of the interface, I believe, to just add a class to that view. And it's basically the same uh, with blocks. You, you don't know uh, what the view is called, maybe. Or maybe there are multiple views that need to have the same styling, but they all have different classes because the name of the view is different. Uh, so you can use a field to add a class view component. Uh, semantic fields of Fuse 3 also supports uh, adding classes to rows and fields, so you have just a little more control. So control is nice, but uh, the problem still is that you, you can't really reuse it. Every time that you need to change something, you need to change it multiple times if you have used it for multiple views. So display suite again uh, is also able to add node displays for a few. So you just have a template for a node layout and use that for certain views. That way it's in the repository, so you can have, again, just one place where you can change things. Fuse style plugins is actually really uh, scary for most themers because it's uh, object-oriented PHP. I know that I can't really program object-oriented PHP, so, uh, but it's also just really powerful. If Display Suite or Semantic Fuse or whatever can't help you out, this might be your last option. And uh, in that case, I would advise to uh, work together and let uh, some module developer help you out with this. So it's important to invest in defaults. Everything has a default in Drupal. So 
when I said learn to think in the false, Drupal actually helps you with that. So, and the reason that this is important is to make the admin not rely on themers. People need to be able to do things in the admin without constantly having to consult themers, like I changed it and now it's broken. And we want to keep the code base small, but just efficient. And we want to do everything once. Like I said, uh, when you need to change something, you, want, you don't want to do it six times. So a good default is flexible, so you don't have to override, but simple in case you do have to override. And that's about just not having to do things for the, you need to do things easily, really. Uh, you can have a, a really great default that works for as long as it works, but uh, if it's really complex, then you can't really override it at all. And uh, the thing with the false, uh, there's a, a lot of criticism on markup in the Drupal community, of which a part of uh, I agree with. But there's also just a lot of bashing uh, on the classes and extra divs. And uh, well if you uh, don't know why the classes and divs are there, I can advise to read the uh, Drupal markup guide, which was actually written for module developers. Uh, so you can also just take a look at that, like how do I document uh, like components for module developers. This is just kind of the same thing, but in a more general way. Uh, this tells you like how are stru classes structured in Drupal. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really to love the, uh, just learn to love the markup actually. You don't take everything for granted, but just don't change it because you it w it's not how you would do it. Uh, it's made with the, f the, the point of just making it more flexible. Zen is uh, a base theme that, uh, well, the mission is to uh, have a, a place where you can quickly improve defaults from core or for contrib modules and uh, have a benefit uh, from that immediately once it's committed and not just at uh, major Drupal releases. So, uh, if there's a markup that you really can't live with, then, uh, well, just change it. But then I would say also consider uh, turning it into a patch as well once you've done that anyway. So, fix the defaults and uh, just help module developers out with this and, uh, and hopefully. Yeah, you, you won't have to tweak everything yourself constantly, so you can just focus on your own project. Um, we want to keep everything simple. So it's about uh, when I said like uh, overriding should be easy. The idea is not to override in the first place, so if you stay small, it's like one of the principles, like keep the code base small. But uh, there are actually times when overriding is, is a, a better case. So, uh, the compass or SAS hype, uh, it doesn't really have much to do with scalability, but there's one little thing that I wanted to share with you in case you haven't seen it. Uh, there are people who like uh, using sprites a lot, and uh, well, it's great uh, to just get a little performance improvement, but uh, the problem really is that once, for example, the icons on the left, just in a redesign, get a little bigger, then all the images will move, and you have to update all of the background positions in your theme, which can get really complex and time consuming. So what you're doing here is just compressing things manually, which should never be done actually. It's, you wouldn't compress CSS manually to the strip all the white space when you save it and then you can't edit it anymore. So it's the same actually goes for images. And, uh, Compass lets you just uh, keep your images well organized and then let SAS uh, create the sprite for you. So in your own code, you'll have this, and it will compile that into separate classes that you could use in the markup to get that specific part of the sprite at that spot. And if you don't want to use the classes, then you can use the mixins from Compass to you know, add them to your own selectors. Keeping templates simple is, uh, well, important, and it's important to know when to pro preprocess, when to use theme functions, or when to override. And uh, I've seen a lot of themes where people just stack everything in the template. They, like maybe they don't know they can pre 
who says maybe they don't know which theme functions are there. So we went, they don't know when to use it. Uh, Preprocessors are basically just to separate PHP logic from markup, so markup stays readable. That's about it. And, uh, theme functions are basically like components. They always do the same, regardless of where you are in a module or theme. Or once it's available, it always does that one thing. So they're predictable. Uh, I've had a site with uh, lots of lists on it. And for accessibility reasons, uh, it w became a requirement that every list had its own skip link. Uh, so if every module and every place in the theme used the Drupal's theme item list consistently, then we'd only have to add that skip link once and then be done. Just uh, override the theme function and put the code in between. Uh, but a lot of modules don't actually, so I have to change it to like 20 places. So this is a, uh, a thing where, where I would like to just start making patches and <laughs> get all modules to use theme item list consistently. Uh, it's also important to know when to get someone else. So some people might be uh, just a little afraid of this. Uh, I think their manager will get upset or something. But uh, the principle is really about saving time, staying focused, and doing things properly. So uh, that thing about uh, view style plugins with uh, OO PHP, uh, sure, I could learn to program like that, but it would be a great distraction for me as a front-end developer. So to stay focused, I would say get someone else to do that. Get someone to help you out with that. So another example, when it's good to collaborate with developers. Uh, a client you know, wants, uh, wants something like this. So I have a content type with a lot of fields, and they all have a lot of text, and they want uh, sort of like a table of contents at the top of the page which could jump to all the separate fields. So I could come up with a, a solution for this as a themer, which would probably be something like uh, I create a template for the content type and then uh, add a preprocessor for it and loop through all the fields and create a variable table of contents and print that in a template. And then I would override the field templates and well, put the, the IDs in there so I can actually jump to those. But yeah, it's, it's, it's more of functionality than how it should look. So. It makes a theme bigger without yeah, being actually useful. So this is a case where you actually want just this. You want an extra checkbox in the display settings and say, like, oh, I've created a new field, and this one should come up in the table of contents or not. So we have more control, and you've made it more scalable. So maintenance gets considerably faster and you can reuse it more easily across projects if you wanted to. Collaborating with uh, fellow themers who work on the same project is not always easy. You'll quickly get in each other's way. So this is what uh, a lot of companies do, I think. Just say to one themer, like you go theme the blog, you the web shop, and you the forum section or something. So based on site section, you assign tasks to people. But this really uh, could cause conflicts because there could be a lot of components that appear on multiple sections of the site. So then you, you still don't know like who should do what. People will get in each other's way. And a thing that uh, a lot of people already do is separate element styling from page structure. For example, with a, a reset.css and a layout.css. That's one way to do it. Uh, you could keep doing that with components. So I don't mean just create separate style sheets for components. That's not necessary, but uh, assign components to people instead of side sections. Um, so this uh, prevents people from having to constantly uh, touch each other's code. But yes, you still need to document as documentation is more about maintenance than about initial development. So you'll still probably be confronted with each other's code sooner or later. So that's that part of it. So yeah, so um, I, I think a lot of what Martin is, uh, has said and gone through kind of talks to the fact that 
you know, uh, you, you want to you want to essentially, you know, keep it as simple as possible so that you know um, you divide up your, your your tasks well between between your themers. You you uh, you know you create a simple, clean, light, lightweight theme, and uh, you, you don't create a situation where, which you know we've run into, I'm sure we've all run into, where um, you know there's there's something that's not themed, and all of a sudden people are like, I, well, I've created a new piece of content and it pops up and it's uh, it, it needs to be themed. Anything that anybody creates at any time in your site should 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 at least appear with some kind of a default theming on it that you've that you've designed and that didn't come from a module and that didn't come from you know the default of the the defaults of Drupal. So that's that's the sort of holy grail. That's the you know the ultimate goal. And I think that uh, you know a lot of these that you know the the sort of uh, steps that Martin outlined uh, you know can lead to that. Um, so and then. You know, all the, the the real thing that sort of brings this you know full circle and makes it you know so important is, you know, remember when I talked about Chapter Three and the, how they they updated their brand? Well, that we did the same thing. Aqui updated our brand. Companies update their brands. They change their color palettes. They change their font choices. They they constantly evolve their brands. Brands are not static. There, 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 there's, you know, I don't know if anybody has ever seen this sort of evolution of the sort of Coca-Cola logo over the years. You know, things, you know, things grow and change and 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 evolve, and that's definitely going to happen. So, um, what you don't want to have happen is, okay, we changed our logo. Now I have to update our company logo in 500 different places. Wouldn't it be great to just be able to go in and update the company logo in one place? And that single image file is being referenced everywhere. You know, um, that's just a simple kind of a simple example of, of, of essentially you know what we're talking about. If you theme intelligently and you use some of these methods, then what at, you know you theme intelligently bo both from a design perspective and from a you know a, an actual theming perspective, then you have to do things you know far fewer times you change a few simple things and you and they cascade through everything i mean that's why we have a that's why there is something called a css cascade you know so that so that the simplest uh, changes can 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 affect you know everything in your entire site no matter whether your site has you know 50 pages or or 5 million pages it's all you know there in the cascade that's why we create classes that's why this you know the the the, uh, the sites are structured as they are. That's why Drupal has a theming layer, you know, so that uh, so that these things can be done quickly and simply, and uh, you can you can make big changes to to your design without having to worry about uh, you know going and cleaning up every little place that you know that it might be that it might be different throughout the site. So um, designing repeatable patterns and designing for the CSS cascade now. And if you didn't do it right the first time, <laughs> which I think kind of was the case with, with us, uh, then, then you really quickly learn this lesson because you, know, you go through and you're like, oh, well, now I have to clean up all of this cruft. I have to go through and I have to, I have to uh, you know, do this sort of you know, backbreaking you know, work of going through everything and changing all these little overrides and hunting throughout the, the, the site for, you know, things like, for instance, inline CSS styling, which is, you know, the bane of our existence. So, um, you know, uh, so uh, don't assume your old content will flow seamlessly into the new theme that, you know, it certainly if, if you didn't, if you didn't follow the steps, um, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have big gaps and big holes and things are going to, things are going to reflow and it's going to be ugly. And um, you know I've, I've been in that world, and I don't want to be in that world again. Um, and uh, so you you redesign, you re rebuild, and you do it right the second time. You you follow a you know a pattern that you know that you know is going to save you. It's about saving you immense amounts of work down the road by doing it right the first time, essentially. Um, and then the other thing is um, you know. To go along with what Martin talked about in terms of documentation and the importance of, of uh, you know, of themers and developers, you know, not just writing a little comment in in their code, but but writing real, you know, multiple paragraphs of detailed documentation of I did this because, and if you use this here, it will 
act in this way, you know, and this can be reused for, for these other purposes. So real detailed, thought out, thoughtful documentation throughout, you know, everything. And, and that's true of designers as well. I mean, you know, we're all designers who, any designer who came out of the print world, you know, as I did years ago, um, is, is, is very familiar with, you know, the, the brand standards manual. Well, you know, I, I think the brand standards manual is essentially a thing of the past. It's kind of a, it's an archaic way of looking at things. You have this sort of static printed document that you disseminate around, but a brand standard site is a much more sensible and, uh, and, and really uh, valuable document, not just for, not just for themers, but, uh, and not just for people who are, who, are, who are maintaining or building onto or growing your site on an ongoing basis, but for all the people who are still maintaining the, standard, the, you know, the, the traditional printed assets of, of, of your organization. I mean, if you're, if, if you're a, it doesn't matter whether you're a, a nonprofit or a corporation, you know, you're gonna have printed materials, collateral that you, that you send out to people, you're gonna have training materials, you know, um, you're gonna have all kinds of, uh, of, of other assets that, um, that, are, that are digital assets that go along with your brand and having all of those things in, uh, as well in a brand standard site where any partner or any, you know, or any, um, you know, branch office or, uh, or other, you know, people who collaborate with you can just go and quickly and in, uh, grab the assets that they need and have permissions and roles to be able to get into you know, that brand standard site and just, and get that logo or, I mean, how many times, designers, how many times have you gotten an email from somebody, can you send me the logo? You know, if you have a site where the logo exists, that task is now off your plate. You know, they go, they get the exact logo they need in the format they need it, you've got it there in multiple different formats and, uh, you know, and people can, can, can have a resource where they can uh, go to and constantly know you, you know, the, the current state of the brand. Because the site can be updated, you know, on a daily basis. So if anything changes, it's instantly available to everybody. So, um, and obviously your, your master theme, having your master, your master theme available, then you can retheme other, you can, you, can use that, uh, you can use that theme as a theme for other sites, which is something that, we're, that, uh, that, that we've done. You know, you, you take a theme that you've created for one site and, you know, clone, clone an entirely new site from so, um, uh, with that, um, we'll take some questions. Anybody? Hi. Um, well, first of all, thanks, guys. Great talk. Um, the question that I had was uh, in for theming. Actually, um, I use less CSS or it's similar to Compass. Um, and I, I try and use stuff from Nicole Sullivan and the sort of object-oriented CSS notion. Is that something that you'll do in encompassing functionality for a block to actually enclose it in only one sort of ID selector or that, that kind of notion and then ha kind of have all your CSS encapsulated within it? Um, well, uh, I don't really understand the question exactly. Uh, like you mean like that certain styles should only apply within the block section? Um, well, it's sort of nesting selectors inside sort of a, a global one for that entity. Yeah, you, then you really need to be sure that there are absolutely no components on that page that need to be used in a different section, of course. So, uh, I do think that it conflicts with the whole idea behind the component styling, because it, uh, the idea is to never, uh, how can I say this? Uh, you never know when you might need to reuse something. So maybe you aren't reusing it right now, but maybe it gets redesigned just a little bit so it can go on the web shop section as well. Or yeah, so I, don't, I don't think I'm getting it across well, I'm sorry. Because I, I think it would support that, actually, if it's, this is how you identify that component um, but it's just a way of writing the CSS so it actually isolates those selectors and they can't kind of bleed out of that, that styling for that component. I think, I think the point of the components is that they can bleed out once you would want that or want someone who doesn't control the theme but is doing things or adding things in the admin that once he does that, things won't 
look like crap. But, uh, but, and, and if you isolate that, then uh, there's no point really in, in, in thinking in components because you're, once you've made them, you, you're locking them, so to speak, if, uh, and, they, and you can't reuse them in other sections of the site. Thanks. Part of the biggest problem we encountered so far is actually for front-end FEMA coming in on a Drupal 5 project and converting to Drupal 7, uh, for future expandability, how would you document a, the theme for, a, for future expandability insofar as how would you itemize where all the components, the classes belong within the CSS sheet? If you've got a CSS sheet of, of 2,000 lines, how would you easily summarize that and explain yeah. that within the site or within your style guide for a future front-end developer? So the, the CSS is probably not well-structured, or uh, what really is the No, I mean the, the structure so itself. If you want something to go easily go in there, change an image to another image, how would you easily explain that for another front-end developer coming in and taking the project on maybe two years down the line? So uh, I, th I, think, I think I might be able to answer at least part of this because you know, that's one of the things that, 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 that we went through recently is upgrading you know, from, from, from D5. And um, I, essentially, a lot of times you really just need to throw out a lot of that old CSS you know, um, and, uh, and, 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 and rewrite it. You know, um, ideally, hopefully you don't have to throw away code that, that's been, that people have spent time on and, and worked hard on, but, but um, sometimes, sometimes you do. And, uh, I, but I think that you know, if, if it's well commented you know, um, you know, right in the code itself, that um, you know, I don't know whether you can talk to that a little bit in terms of how you know, your processes for documentation or best practices for documentation of CSS style sheets. Yeah, well, uh, I kind of see, like, uh, I template the PHP with a lot of preprocessors and theme functions. It, they always have the, the typical comment blocks above with just, this function does that, and then the longer description if necessary. Uh, when I write components, I just have the, the same structure, just blocks or components, and every block has just a comment above it, um, just as small or big as it needs to. And particularly instructions for module developers that use it like that, you know, just as simple as possible, but don't leave out too much details. For example, with the, when I need to document a, a component that is a skip link or something, then it has like certain classes attached to it, uh, which lean on maybe some helper classes. Like in Drupal 7, you have element focusable, which leans on element invisible. So together, they make invisible links, focusable with the keyboard. So things like that really need to be documented. Uh, it's just, yeah, really like, what, what would I need when I were, were a module developer to use this? Uh, it's really uh, hard to explain when, uh, when I don't know what code exactly is there. But. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? No, that was, a that was, that was a clear, so yeah, thank you. Anything else? Okay, well, there's uh, no more questions. I just want to thank everybody for, uh, for attending and uh, enjoy the rest of the DrupalCon. <laughs> <laughs>